as you're seated this morning, please turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 7. And today's passage is chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. And I know many of you have told me that in the past, maybe you attended church, you didn't bring a Bible. Who needed a Bible? What do you need a Bible this morning? And if you, if you don't have one with you, you can pick up one of those pew Bibles. If you turn to page 964, you will find Matthew chapter 7, verses 24 to 29. This last week, I read about a home builder in Dallas. He was a Christian man. He was trying to live out his faith as a believer, as a Christian in his business. And that meant that as a contractor, he was committed to building good homes to the glory of God with sturdy walls, with adequate insulation, with a good, solid foundation. And this guy, because of his love for Christ, paid attention to important details that the buyer could not see, but he knew Jesus the Lord could see. And so that affected everything. Now other builders, however, wanted to make a quick buck. Their focus was on making money, not on making good houses, quality houses. So the Christian man was losing out to the competition because he knew and discovered that, you know, couples buying homes were primarily concerned about how the structures looked. It was all about appearances. And that placed the honest, conscientious Christian home builder at a disadvantage because if he gave attention to good insulation and a solid foundation, he didn't have money left, not much of it in the budget for the decorative touches. If he put in the decorations, well, he had to raise his prices. He was getting slaughtered by the unscrupulous competition. And what bothered him most was that the people buying the homes did not care about what was hidden, what they couldn't see. They weren't interested in that. They only expected to live in the houses a few years, so appearances more than quality are what really mattered to them. Appearances. Years later, a man drove through the neighborhood built by those unscrupulous contractors, and it looked like a slum. Shoddy workmanship showed itself in time. In time. And you know, when you and I do not pay attention to what is hidden, especially to the foundation, a day will come when what is hidden will be revealed going to be seen. It's going to be out in the open. Now today at the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus has some words for us about good housing. He wants to drive home an eternal lesson about how to effectively build, yeah, build a flat, how to build a life, how to build a life. And we're not surprised that he uses the picture of two builders. He was a, a, a carpenter by vocation after all, right? He knew how to work with wood. He used these hands to work for the firm of Joseph and Sons in Nazareth. He knew about building. He knew the difference between a solid house and a shoddy one. And so now at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, this carpenter, preacher, who is God, the Lord Jesus, he contrasts, on the one hand, wise, and on the other, foolish builders. Notice our passage. Matthew chapter 7, starting at verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and burst against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded upon the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, 
crowds were amazed at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. Now I want to study our passage with you this morning under four points. Let's begin the, with the first, notice letter A, the context. And the question always becomes, now how does this last section of the Sermon on the Mount, how does it fit with the flow of Jesus' great sermon? Verse 24, therefore, first word, therefore, that tells us Jesus is drawing an implication from the prior verses in the Sermon on the Mount. What has Christ been talking about? Well, you remember in verses 21 to 23, Jesus taught us that judgment is coming. Everyone will stand before Jesus the Lord. Many, he says, will be surprised to hear the words of verse 23. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. That's got to be one of the scariest verses in the Bible. That's got to be one of the most terrifying things to hear. But wouldn't it we would be terrified or stirred up by that today and in this life, rather than God be merciful, rather than hearing those words one day from Jesus and sent to hell. Now in verse 21, you remember, Jesus says it's not enough to merely call him Lord. Even an affectionate, fervent, intimate Lord, Lord. That's not enough. You have to obey him and his Father. Now if ever there was a day that that message needs to be heard, it's today. Because literally, as you know and I know, millions of people call Jesus Lord. I mean, you really virtually can't get elected in this country unless you at least say that. You've got to at least say you're a Christian. It's still a respectable thing to do. The majority of Americans will say it. Lord, Jesus is Lord. But that's not adequate. You have to obey Him. You have to do His Father's will. And those who truly know Jesus, or better, who are known by Jesus, prove that that relationship is there through their obedience, through their submission to Him as Lord. That's what we looked at last week. And you remember how in verses 15 to 20, false prophets are known by their bad fruit, the product of their lives, not, again, by their words. The, the true prophet bears the fruits of righteousness and obedience. And so then when we come down here to verses 24 to 27, they follow all of this as Jesus fittingly calls us to obey his teaching. Obey. He's driving home his message now at the end. Don't just hear this sermon. Do it. Do it, says Jesus. Act on it. Move. Hear and respond. Like his half-brother says in James 1.22. Prove yourselves what? Doers of the word. And not merely hearers who delude themselves. Don't deceive yourself. Don't fool yourself, says James. Don't think it's good enough just to hear, to be orthodox, to say the right words. You've got to act. You've got to obey. So that's the context. Now next, notice with me letter B. Let's talk about the two foundations. The two foundations. Verse 24 again. Therefore everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. And then the other foundation, verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. And who's Jesus talking to? Verse 24, verse 26. Everyone, he says, everyone who hears these words of mine. Now that, of course, doesn't just include his original audience. That includes you. That includes me. Now think about this. We have spent months studying the Sermon on the Mount together. Months. Preaching through it. Studying it. Making application. Now what? 
Now what? Well, Jesus has one last illustration for us. Two men building two very different homes. But the differences were not immediately obvious. Think of all the two homes had in common. Both were permanent houses. These men, Jesus said, they're not erecting tents. They're not putting up tool sheds. They're no doubt wanting to build a house for their families, where they would settle down, raise kids, pass the home on to their children. They were probably building similar places to dwell also. Jesus doesn't underscore any difference in the design, did he? Maybe the front door is in the same place, and both of them, the windows in the same place. For the purposes of the story, the two buildings could have been identical. They could have been built from the same blueprints. It's like our current rental as the Phillips family, and our last one just one street over. We just moved one street to a house that was identical to the last one. It was the easiest move we ever made. I took the picture off of this wall on this house, and I walked into the new house and put it on the identical wall in the new house. Even the silverware drawer just was right there in the same place in the kitchen. Imagine how easy a move that is. Oh yeah, where did the shoes go? Right there on that wall like they did in the last house. I mean, everything was identical. It was great. It was that simple, that corresponding. And so with Jesus' illustration, I mean, they're so identical, a squirrel could have done the move for us, right? <laughs> the houses in the story could have been built exactly the same. They could have looked exactly the same to the casual observer. He wouldn't have seen anything significantly different. But there was this huge difference, says Jesus. It wasn't obvious, but it was fundamental. It was crucial. The two structures had entirely different foundations, didn't they? That's where Jesus puts the emphasis. One man built on a foundation of solid rock, and that made his house safe and secure. The other built on a foundation of sand, fragile, unstable. Now why in the world would anyone want to build on sand? That seems moronic, it seems stupid. Think about it though. The land is smooth, it's inviting, it's easy to build on that. Building on sand takes a lot less work. Think about the alternative, digging into rock. Well, that requires much more expense, plus sweat and time. How much easier just to build on the sand? We know all about this in Southern California. Who cares about the foundation as long as the mansion is exquisite and it looks on this west coast, you know as well as I do, people build right on top of the San Andreas Fault. And I don't remember where it was, but I remember after one of the recent earthquakes, someone scrolled on the side of their destroyed house, San Andreas Fault. Someone else crossed it off and said, no, the builders, you know. Don't blame it on San Andreas. How many people build on the cliffs overlooking the Pacific Ocean? How many? Or right next door to the waves on the sandy shoreline. How can you beat that amazing view of the sunset? Just go down there to the Malibu Colony. It's spectacular. You walk right outside the back door and you hit the waves. We understand that. Recently, Donna and I were walking along the shore down south. And all along the way, all on the shoreline, you could see evidence where the waves were eroding the rocks, were eroding the cliffs, and people were doing their very best to hold back the waves. They put concrete wall after concrete wall, but what would you guess was right on top of all those cliffs that were being eroded by those waves, right above the signs warning event up against falling sand and shifting rock and so on, what would you guess was right on top of it all houses, wall to wall houses. They had a spectacular view of the ocean. And right underneath, the evidence of slides and warnings. And I wonder, you know, because we're right up next to these cliffs, at any moment they could have given way, no doubt about it. 
How many times have we seen those storms slam into our beaches right here, right? Just drive right down the coast. How many times have we seen those storms carve away the sand under the house? And we've watched as those exquisite multi-million dollar mansions just slid right down the hill. And some of them tumbled right into the Pacific. And yet amazingly, right after the disaster, still others will doggedly build more houses on the unstable, slippery hillsides once again. Now why in the world is Jesus giving us this story? What's he trying to get at? Obviously he's not giving us a mini seminar on the construction business. He could have done that. He's not primarily concerned about how we build our homes. Rather, he as the all-wise Lord God is telling us how to build our lives, isn't he? He's concluding the sermon by telling us how to build our lives. Our lives which are like houses and every person without exception is building some type of home this morning. And that includes you, doesn't it? That includes you. You too. And me. All of us. We have some kind of foundation. Is it strong? Or is it weak? Are you building your life on rock? Or on sand? That's the sermon title. That's the question of our passage. Well, someone asks, now I want to build my life on rock. How do I do it? I'm convinced that's the kind of life I want. What do I do? Verse 24. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts upon them may be compared to a wise man who built his house upon the rock. Did you notice there? The wise man. So I had a first question. What is wisdom? Biblical wisdom is this. Here it is. I want to just give you two words. What is wisdom? Skillful living. That's it. Skillful living. I've probably said it a hundred times or more with my kids as we study through Proverbs. They, they say the same thing. They repeat it back. How do I live skillfully? How do I live wisely? Well, first of all, notice in verse 24, you have to hear the words of Christ. That's crucial, isn't it? You have to know Jesus' teachings. You have to know His commands because, you see, God's Word is clear that in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, Colossians 2, 3. In Christ, in Christ alone. In fact, there is no wisdom apart from Christ. None. And that's why in 1 Corinthians 1.30, Christ Jesus, says Paul, became to us wisdom from God. He is our wisdom. So stop running to any other source. Go to Christ. Christ, the source and the only source of true wisdom. And listen to Him by reading His words, read the Scriptures, read especially and reread the Sermon on the Mount because that's what He's talking about, isn't He, right here. That in the context, the words of, of the Sermon on the Mount, tutus, that's what He has in mind. These words, He says, that He's just preached, have those in mind. Colossians 3.16, let the Word of Christ richly dwell within you. Hear, think on, meditate upon, memorize his words. But that's not enough. Because, verse 24, he says, act upon them. Poieto, the present tense of acts. It, it's a customary present. It's indicating obedience as a characteristic of life. In other words, just like those two testimonies that Warren told us about this morning. When you meet Jesus Christ, He changes everything, doesn't He? Those men were not the same as before they met Christ. I mean, He transformed them. Even the guy who for 25 years, did you hear that? He was a servant in the church, a deacon, an elder, had all the right words, could actually go as a guest speaker and and talk about the Christian life as though he's some kind of expert. And did you, did you see? 
He didn't even know the Lord for 25 years, <coughs> serving, leading, doesn't even know the Lord. If God's grace had not come to that man, do you know what he would have heard on the last day? He would have heard, verse 23, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. But he could have said something very similar to verse 22, but Lord, I served you for 25 years as an elder, as a deacon, as a leader. I spoke at Christian colleges about the Christian life. I know what I'm talking about. And have Jesus say, I never knew you. So what is it? What is it that Christ calls us to? A hearing and an acting on His words. A life marked by obedience. A life marked by the S word that our world so hates to hear. Submission. Christ is Lord and I submit to Him. Well, since it's our last paragraph in the Sermon on the Mount, I want to just very briefly, if I can with you, review the Sermon on the Mount with the aim of obeying and submitting ourselves to these very words. So turn back with me to chapter 5. Do you remember the Beatitudes? That's where we started because that's where Jesus started. Back in chapter 5, verse... Three. Do you remember what we said back then? However many years ago it was. I don't really know. I didn't check how many months back we started. But we said this is God's pathway to true happiness. And his pathway to his favor. And look where he begins. Blessed, happy, favored are the poor in spirit. He begins with a brokenness, a humility, an attitude where I am a beggar on the inside. I am so poor. It's not just that I have maybe enough to get by this day. I don't even have that. I am so living hand to mouth in my spiritual life that I have no reserves. Moment by moment, I depend on God and His provision. Just like we sang, I don't bring anything in my hand to God. My hand is empty. But that's a good thing, isn't it? Because it's open to receive them from God. And that's what Jesus is talking about. Being a beggar on the inside. In 2014, as we review the Sermon on the Mount, there is no room for proud self-reliance, but this sense of desperation for God. God, I, I need you. And I have nothing apart from you. I lean on nothing and no one but you. And so how are you doing in 2014 already? So that sense of desperation. God, I am a beggar. Pride is my worst enemy. Humility is my best friend. Because you know what humility does? It opens the pathway for God's grace, doesn't it? God opposes the proud. Pride will shut out His grace in our lives. But humility opens wide the door for grace. Pride brings God's opposition, James 4, 6. But may we be a people who know the happiness and the favor of God in poverty of spirit. That's where we began. And then in verse 4, do you remember how Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn? And we said, it almost seems like such a radical contradiction. Happy are those who mourn. But Jesus is not being morbid with us. See, when I see the amazing grace of God that I just read to you from Ephesians chapter 2, I see what I was saved from. I see how desperately wicked was my heart apart from Christ. When I see how, as a Christian, I continue to battle against sin moment by moment and lose. When I see, as James, Jesus' half-brother, says that we all stumble in many ways, that brings me right back to a poverty of spirit, a mourning over my sin, a sense that I love God, and therefore I hate my sin, and I want to put it to death. So how are you doing in 2000?
with radical, you ready for the word again? Mortification. I hate my sin. I mourn over it. I want God. And I want His righteous way. And all I have is Jesus Christ. All I can claim is that I'm clinging to His cross. All I can boast in is what God has done in Christ. That's it. And that's enough. And that's amazing. You know what that makes us? Verse 5, it makes us gentle people, humble, meek people, not harsh towards others, kind and patient, because we, through Christ, have been humbled and we want to treat others as God the Father has treated us in Christ. And so there's not this self-preoccupation, but we are humble servants. And you know what that produces then? Verse 6, there is this hunger and thirst for righteousness. I mourn over my sin. There's a sense of poverty, but you know what I really want? I want to be righteous. I want to be a righteous man, don't you? I want to be a righteous Christian. And Jesus says that is the pathway to favor with God and true happiness. So i got to ask you then, since we're pretty much done with the Sermon on the Mount, how hungry are you? How passionate and fervent are you to be righteous in 2014? I hate my sin, but I want your righteous way, Lord. Or maybe this morning you would have to be honest and say, I am in a religious rut. I'm just going through the motions. Maybe you're like that guy that Warren was talking about, and you've been doing it for years, maybe decades, because you don't even know Jesus Christ. God, help us through your Son. The pathway of happiness is hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And Jesus says, those who do so will be satisfied. And then look at verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, because our Father has so treated us in Christ. Verse 8. Blessed are the pure in heart. That It's not going to be good enough. It's not going to satisfy us just to look religious on the outside. So that I say the right words, and you think, wow, man, Pastor Paul can really pray. Or you think, man, I hope people are watching as I give and as I do, because... That's all that really matters, right? Just the appearances. As long as people think I'm spiritual, it doesn't matter if I really am, does it? Yeah, it does. God wants from us a purity of heart, an integrity that when no one is looking except for God, we're just living for God. That's the path to blessedness and happiness to have God our Father's favor. And then what else do people like this do who are following Jesus and acting? Verse 9, blessed are the peacemakers. Like in Ephesians we saw at the beginning of the year, here's God, the Holy Spirit, who's brought about this amazing unity. God the Father has done this through the death of His Son. He's united Jew and Gentile, broken down the barrier, one body. He's composed us together, and He's brought this peace. And then He says, now you agonize maintain it. Now you labor and pursue the reconciliation of those not at peace in the body. Because blessed are the peacemakers. And then if we really are wanting to be radically surprised, if you remember, in verses 10 to 12, he says the pathway to blessing, to happiness, to favor with God is when we're actually persecuted for the sake of righteousness in verses 10 to 12. Why? Why persecuted? Jesus says, verse 11, on account of me. It's because when you live that way, that beatitude way, when you are sold out for Jesus Christ, then the world will notice. And amazingly, some will be saved, but others are just going to hate you. And they're going to hate you because they hate Christ. And you stand in Jesus' place and they can't get to Him, so they're going to take out their anger and their hatred of God and the light. They're going to take it out on you. And Jesus said, just rejoice. Be glad. Verse 12, because your reward in heaven is great. 
happy, favored are the persecuted. How you doing? Are you finding yourself avoiding speaking the truth this year? Because that's not a popular thing to do. You know what it will lead to. It's going to lead to people hating you. So if I just be quiet, I can avoid persecution and suffering. No, says Jesus. You please Jesus, and you be dead to public opinion, and you'll be blessed. And then you remember in verses 13 to 16, he says, you know what you are for me in the world? You're salt and light. Salt, you're retarding the decay, the corruption of a rotten and rotting world, and you are shining Christ's light. Now, how then are you doing in obedience to the teachings of Jesus? How's this striking you this morning? Their implications and their applications. Because you see, in verses 17 to 20, this is a superior righteousness from Jesus. He says, this surpasses the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees. And if you don't have this righteousness, you're not going to go to heaven. And you can imagine everybody in that day saying, well then, I give up. Because if I have to be better, more righteous than the Pharisees, well, forget it. You know, those scribes and the Pharisees, well, they're the most righteous people of all. And Jesus says, hmm, not good enough. Your righteousness has to surpass theirs. He's calling for a radical superior righteousness that utterly humbles us and breaks us and drives us to Jesus Christ, to poverty of spirit. You know what Jesus says? Verses 21 to 26. 2014, if we're going to act on His Word, means I have to deal with anger and hatred in my heart, which are like murder in our hearts, Jesus says. In verses 23 to 24, He says we're supposed to seek reconciliation with your brother, or you won't be right with God. Did you hear that? If you don't seek reconciliation with your brother, you will not be right with God. Wow. That's what Jesus says. In verses 27 to 32, you remember, Jesus says, deal with lust. Now we have a world that is bent on lust, that promotes lust. And Jesus says, that's not, that's not what my followers do. See, that lust in your heart, says Jesus, that's adultery. He says, you and I have to deal radically with sin. That means, as he continues, being seriously devoted to our marriage because what God has joined together, let no man separate through divorce, Matthew 19, 6. Now in verses 29 and 30, how serious is Jesus about our obedience in 2014? How serious is he about us confronting our sin? Mourning over it, addressing it, not choosing to coexist with it. Look how he speaks, yes, with hyperbole. But the point is obvious. If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out, throw it from you. It is better for you that one of the parts of your body perish than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. I am so serious, says Jesus, about you dealing with your sin that you will spare no expense. Because better to address the sin now than to have Jesus confront it later and cast you into hell. See how radical that is? See how countercultural that is? And do not be like them, says Jesus, as he calls us to a righteousness that is so different than the way our world lives. Do not be like them. Do you remember how in verses 33 to 37, your word, says Jesus, is to be your bond. When you say something, it's got to be reliable. It's got to express integrity. You've got to mean it when you say it. You've got to stand behind it. In other words, when I say yes, you've got to believe that I mean yes, and I'm going to act on that yes. When you say no, we've got to believe that you really mean no, and you're going to act on that no, and you're going to hold to your word, and you're going to stick to it and keep it. And then in verses 38 to 48, he calls us to this superior righteousness that does not pursue retaliation, but love, even of our enemies. Be like God in this, says Jesus. 
Be like this so that you may be sons of your Father, verse 45, who is in heaven. For he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good, and sends right, a rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And you look around our county, you see the fabulous wealth, you see the beauty of where we live, my favorite place I've ever lived. And you think, God is so good. He's even good to people who hate him. He's good to people who shake the fist at him, who pretend that they don't believe in him. And you and I know better. And God says, you see how I treat wicked people? How I'm good to them? Be like me. How are you doing in 2014? Not retaliating, not getting even, loving even your own enemies. You want to be driven to be poor in spirit? You want to be driven so that you and I come to the cross with an open hand to receive and we don't bring anything and we don't boast about anything? You know what will do it? Look at verse 48. Do you remember this? Do you remember the standard of Jesus? <laughs> Therefore, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. He doesn't say just try your best. That's good enough. Man. Remember how we talk about this when we share Christ with people? We tell them, you know, you want to understand what God's righteous standard is like? It's like God saying, okay, come out here to the ocean side right here on the shoreline. If you want to get to heaven, you've got to jump from this shore here to, to Catalina Island, okay? That's all you got to do. And some of us can run, and we might be able to get 10 or 15 or 20 feet out into that water with one jump. But the obvious point is you and I are not even going to come close to jumping to Catalina. And when Jesus says, here's the righteous standard that I expect, he says, you must be perfect like God. How's that? If you had a shred of pride before verse 38, and if you contained that pride afterwards, you didn't get the point. His standard of superior righteousness is God's righteousness. And you and I do not measure up. Nothing to the cross I bring. I only come to cling to the cross. As someone poor in spirit, who mourns over his sin, but you know what? Hungry and thirsting after righteousness. The righteousness of God through Christ. But that's only one chapter. And then look at chapter 6. You know what he talks about? Do you remember in 2014? No hypocrisy. No putting on the show for other people. In verses 1 to 18, not in our giving, not in our praying, not in our fasting. How are you doing in obeying the commands of Christ, the instructions of Christ? No hypocrisy, no show, no focusing on appearances only. Because God looks at the heart. Wow. And then in the middle of verses 1 to 18, that fabulous teaching on prayer, on the Lord's Prayer. In verses 9 to 13, we noted the order there. That when we come to God, we said so often our praying is immature. It's a quick naming of God and then a whole long list of needs and a whole long list of wants. And Jesus says that's not how we need to pray. We start rather verse 9 with an acknowledgement of God our Father. And an acknowledgement that He's the God who rules in heaven. And our desires that His name be hallowed, respected, revered, that there is worship of His name and a seeking of glory to His name. And so we learn, we don't just rush into God's presence with our requests. Who are we talking to? Our Father in heaven. Set Him apart. All that He is. All that He's revealed Himself to be in His works. Focus on His will, His kingdom. And then, yes, we are a dependent people. We depend on Him for our daily sustenance, forgiveness. And there is this self-distrust that comes through for the Christian that prays like this, verse 13. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Because God, I know myself. If you don't help me, I will surely fall. God, I need you. 
And then that radical statement in verses 14 to 15 is that if you and I will not forgive others for their sins against us, God will not forgive us for our sins against Him. You see the standard that Jesus lays out here? And then in verses 19 to 34, He tells us in 2014 to store up our treasures in heaven, living for eternity, and He says, in effect, don't waste your life. Don't waste your life this year. What are you treasuring? What are you serving? In verse 24, Jesus makes it clear, look at, no one can serve two masters. It's either going to be God, he says, or things and money, but the love of things and money will destroy your love for God. You can't do both. Rather, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Verse 33, trust him to meet your needs today. Don't worry because you see, verse 34, we just live one day at a time. Tomorrow's going to have its troubles. Just follow Jesus today. And how can you and I live that way? Well, all throughout the Sermon on the Mount and in this final section of chapter 6, he reminds us, verse 30, God cares for you. He's good to all of his creatures, especially to us. Verse 32, he knows your needs. In fact, verse 8 of chapter 6, even before you ask them, and we can add, because this was pre-cross, we can add, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? And then we come into chapter 7, Christ's instructions and commands, he expects us to hear them, he expects us to act on them, to put them into practice now and immediately. In chapter 7, verses 1 to 5, you remember how he calls us now in this new year, put off judgmentalism, hypocrisy that confronts sin in others simultaneously where we will not deal with our own more major personal sins first. And so Jesus in chapter 7 calls us to a discernment, a right judging that is needed, a judging with righteous judgment, John 7, 24. A discernment of our own sins, and then helping others with their sins, verse 5. A discernment with unbelievers and the gospel opportunities that God brings to us, verse 6. And I ask you again, is all of this showing your great need this morning? It is with me. Our great need before our Heavenly Father. Well then you know what you do. You persist in asking that your needs be met by Him in Christ. Look at verses 7 and 8. Of chapter 7, they're so simple. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks it will be opened. So in 2014, as we finish out the Sermon on the Mount, keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. I can't just live my Christian life today and be done. And then tomorrow, well, I did it yesterday. I'm done for the year. I've, I've done enough religious things. I've been spiritual enough. No, we, we don't want that. We're not interested in religion and show. We want this ever-deepening relationship with the living God, this ever-deepening dependence on Jesus Christ, and God promises to hear and supply. Look how good God is. Verse 11, Jesus says, if you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? If He doesn't give it, it's not good for you. What should you be asking for? The things that he's taught us in the Sermon on the Mount. And then finally, the golden rule, verse 12. In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you. For this is the law and the prophets. How you doing? I'm acting, acting out in response to the teachings of Jesus Christ, obeying Him, submitting to Him. We have to say on the one hand, Jesus expects us to obey. Isn't that what He's saying at the end of the Sermon on the Mount? You must act on these things. But simultaneously, we can rejoice that He died for you and me so that you and I could live the Sermon on the Mount. 
It's not going to be us gritting our teeth and saying, okay, God, I got this. Now that I understand, now that I've been reminded, all right, I got this. Uh-uh. We come in poverty of spirit. We come in humility. And we rejoice that Jesus Christ died for sinners like us to empower us through the Spirit, to enable us to live the Sermon on the Mount. And where we don't, and that's a big don't, a regular don't for us as Christians, we come back and what do we do? We come with empty hands, with broken hearts, and we cling to the cross. God, if you didn't do this through Jesus Christ, I would have nothing. But in Christ I have everything. And so in verse 24, as we come to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is telling us how to build a life. Build it through obedience to his teachings, he says. The alternative is verse 26. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act upon them will be like a foolish man who built his house upon the sand. We're all building something. What are you building? Some people build their lives on possessions, what they own, passions, worldly pleasure. Position is my job. It's the offices I hold, that's who I am. Jesus says, my way is better. My way is better. Verse 24, hear, act in obedience. And why is this so important? We're going to just say this briefly because next week we're going to go into greater detail. Let us see the two outcomes. The two outcomes. Verses 24 and 25, you hear his words and act upon them. You build your life on the rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, and yet it did not fall, it had been founded upon the rock. Verses 26 and 27, you hear the words of Christ and don't act on them, it's like building on sand, and the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew, and burst against that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. What's the context here? Can I remind you? Judgment is coming, that's the context. The context is everyone one day standing before Jesus Christ. And in light of eternity, it will be relatively soon. This world will be done. There's an imminency to the return of Christ. And our eternal destinies will depend on what we do with Christ's words. And accordingly, what Jesus does with us. Verse 24. Act on His words. Submit to Christ. Verse 25, you will stand in the judgment. How? Through faith in Christ, through faith in His work, salvation through Him and His accomplished substitutionary atonement on the cross. The alternative, verse 26, hear but don't act, don't obey, don't submit to Christ the Lord. Verse 27, Jesus says, you will be destroyed in the judgment. You will be destroyed. You will be cast into hell forever. Jesus taught all about hell all throughout the Sermon on the Mount. Verse chapter 6, do you remember? He talked about those, rather verse uh, 29 of chapter 5. Your right eye makes you stumble. Remember, tear it out. Better that you lose one part of your body than your whole body be thrown into hell forever. One house is going to stand. One house is going to fall. The outcomes are there. Two of them, heaven and hell. And how did they respond? Well, they responded with amazement. The result was that when Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at his teaching. He was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. That's letter D, the conclusion. They were no doubt astonished over the matter of his teaching. No doubt what he said, but also the manner. He was speaking like he's God. Because he is. But you know what? Amazement is not enough. And I want to ask you to bow your heads with me as we close this morning. Amazement over the teaching of Jesus Christ is not enough. It's not enough for us to say at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, Wow! What an amazing teacher! What powerful words! Yes, that's true. But he is the Lord Jesus. And He calls you and me to not only be wowed by His teaching, amazed 
over the matter and the manner of it, but to submit to Him, to repent, to believe in Him, to submit to Him as Lord, turning from my way to His way. And that is the call as we conclude this morning of the Sermon on the Mount. Submit to Jesus Christ the Lord. Have you yet?